Good afternoon, church. I need to practice. Let me practice. Good afternoon, church. Lest I get the timing wrong. Good afternoon, church. Good. Now, today's title is Why We Must Discern the Times We Are Living In. A friend of mine who is a non Christian would sometimes forward me some interesting news about work, events, and developments. And then you follow with a brief text message of his personal observation, opinions, or comments relating to the contents. Things like, end of the world is coming, or something to that effect. And my response is, I usually respond it, it is written in the Bible. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. I will not read out the whole passage, but it says, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And then he never get back to me. Now, indeed, the Bible has much to say about the end times. We are living closer to the end of the age than any other generations before us. In fact, the last days, or end times, is one of the most discussed subjects in our scripture. The Bible speaks more about this period of time than any other period in human history. By the way, I, I, I realize I have to turn my head, huh? scan on a wide scan. Where, where did I stop? Now, the Bible speaks more about this period of time than any other period in our human history. And see, if the Bible has placed so much emphasis on the last days, and possibly our generation, we, as God's people, need to ask ourselves some very important questions. Concerning this, how then should we live? What should our focus and priorities be at this time? How should we direct our energy and resources? Are we properly discerning the importance of our day and hour? Friends, brothers and sisters, unless we truly understand that we have been placed on this earth for a time such as this and for his purpose, we will find ourselves struggling to fully engage in the kingdom life. As God's people, it is important that you see yourself as a strategic role player in what God wants to do. It is important for us to discern the importance of our role and of the time we are living in if we are to fulfill our redemptive calling and to reach out to the lost world. This afternoon, the book of Joel as a message for us. The people of Joel's day, they had a lack of awareness of the time they were living in. They were asleep spiritually, and even during an unprecedented national disaster, they were still asleep. There's no awakeness. They were still slumber. And so Joel starts his message by telling them in verse 2, Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. 
He starts his message by telling them to hear and listen. Now, this is a double calling. This double call to pay attention reveals the importance of his message. And it's also for us today. The land has come to a complete devastation because of the swarm of locusts. And the situation then was desperate. No one could have ever imagined something like this would happen. And this would be remembered throughout generations. The great-grandchildren of those living, they would hear about the terrible plague of locusts that strips the land of its vegetations, agricultures, and causing the economic losses and levied scotch. It is no ordinary invasion by the locusts. Several waves of locusts destroyed the agricultural produce of the land. What one wave, as we've read, what one wave left uneaten, the other wave of locusts came and destroyed. It was a complete devastation. The foreign nations around Judah, then, they may well have understood the plague in a very pure, in a very purely natural way. They might have said that, oh, it is bad luck for Judah, who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's bad luck. Because there were no pesticides in those days. And they might even blame global warming. It is bad luck for Judah, whose food supply was wiped out. But to Joel, the prophet, these events represented God's chastening hand on the nation. Sinful choices eat away our soul. Sinful systems wreck up our world. God hates sin because sins devour human life. And so perhaps we, we can pause for a minute and invite you all to think what are the swarm of locusts now in your life? It is interesting to note that some Scholars interpret the local, the locust plagues described in chapter one as symbolic of a foreign army of people. But in my view, the evidence favors an army of real locusts. Now the nation of Judah should have seen the locusts as a sign of this coming judgment. Remember centuries before, in Torah, the law of Moses, Moses had written in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where he listed out the respective blessings and curses for obedience and disobedience. Now, God promised great blessings if his people were obedient to his covenant with them. With, with, with them. And they would have more than enough food, healthy flocks and herds, and large and fruitful families. But for disobedience, for disobedience, I let the verse six speak for itself. You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little, because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine or gather the grapes, because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the oil 
because the olives will drop off. You will have sons and daughters, but you will not keep them because they will go into captivity. Swarms of locusts will take over all your trees and the crops of your land. But the locusts were not the full judgment that could fall upon the people of Judah. And so Deuteronomy continues. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eager swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect of the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine or olive oil, nor any calves of your herds or lambs of your flock until you are ruined. They will lay siege of all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will be siege all the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, the destructions that fell upon the people of Judah was very severe. But the invading army had not arrived yet. The people of Judah were still in the land. And so Joel, knowing that the next wave of judgment would be severe, called for the nations to repent and turn back to God. Dare not ignore the warnings. His message to them is, there is an urgency in heaven that the people of God become aware of and prepare for the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, there are about 20 times in the scripture that use the day of the Lord, out of which five times appear in the book of Joel. It's the main theme of the book of Joel. Now, it's only three chapters. You will notice he didn't spell out the sins. What sins have they committed? Rather than mentioning the specific sins, Joel proclaimed that God's moral law had been violated. He left it. He left it to God's spirit to impress on the people, the individual sins that they had committed. Unlike the elders, the religious leaders, we see Joel the prophet was conscious of history he remembered the law of Moses, the covenant of God, and he looks at the past to recollect what God has done in order to remind the people and also to remind us of, his, of God's faithfulness and ability. Now, by the way, we do not know much about Joel. All we know is that he was a Hebrew prophet. His name is or means Jehovah is God. The Lord is God. All he wants to reckon, want us to reckon with the reality of the power or sovereignty of the living God and his purpose for creation at the end of the age. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. This is his name. Church, too often we try to force God into our concept. into our concept of who he should be and how he should act. 
and what that means for me and the way I live my life. We fashion God into our likeness instead of allowing him to shape us, to fashion us into his likeness. The day of the Lord is God's day. The Lord is God. He calls the shots. So what then is the right response? Return to me. Chapter 2, verse 12. Return to me. This needs to be our response to God in the age in which we live. Return to God. Now someone said, Abby put it, no prophet of God, no prophet of God properly condemns sin or threatens judgment unless he also gives an invitation to repent and experience God's forgiveness. And the Hebrew prophets never hesitate to cry out against evil, be it national or individual. But at the same time, they were just as eager to proclaim that their God is a gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Verse 13. Remember, earlier, Joel, he was conscious of the history. He remembered the covenant of God. He remembered the law of Moses. He remembered what God desires. And here, this verse, we know it was when God appeared to Moses and revealed himself as a God of gracious and merciful God. Although several isolated verses in the first section urge the people to cry to God, the actual call to repentance is only found in the middle of second chapter. And so while making, the, making it clear that there will be judgment, Joel also highlights God's alternative, and that is deliverance or salvation. For if there is terror or destructions for some on the day of the Lord, there will also be peace and security for other people. So the message of the Bible is, we thank God, it is never one of hopelessness and despair. The Lord is a God of mercy. And if he comes to punish or to destroy, he comes at the same time to save those who repent and turn to him for his forgiveness, for his mercy. So Joel gives us a very wonderful hint about how it works. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. This is the words of special comforts for us. God invites us to see his nature. Yet even now, says the Lord, yet even now, those words are an invitation to you. They remind you that it is still not too late for you to repent. We need to be conscious of the now. Of the now time 
of the present time we are living in. Now, all, I think we have heard many times that repentance in the Bible means much more than just feeling sorry for your sins. It means more than saying that. It means turning away from your sins to embrace God. A radical change, change of your mind about the way you are living, you have been living, changing your heart about the things you have been wrongly valuing, changing your actions and intentions into one that pleases God. And so this is a great mission of every prophet. Not to frighten you with a message of inescapable punishment or doom, but to invite you to come back home to the Lord. Even when they talk about the terrible things that are about to happen on those who persist in evil. But God, spokesmen, the prophets, they invite you to accept God's mercy and salvation. And so the message about judgment is always an opportunity to repent. And after that terrible descriptions of the devastation, the destructions in Joel 2, there comes this wonderful statement at the end of the chapter. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In verse 32, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Apostle Paul quoted this verse in Romans 10, verse 13, where he explained how the way of salvation works through the gospel of Christ. The name of the Lord is Jesus, and he, he really does save anyone who calls upon him. So, the prospect of judgment is real, but salvation from judgment is also real for all who will sincerely turn away from their sin to Christ and call on his name. Return to me. That's what God say to you. These needs to be our response to God in the age we are living in. Return to God. And finally, when you study the Bible, you will discover that God, our God, He has appointed certain seasons or times in which he fulfills certain aspect of his purpose here on earth. And for every purpose under heaven has his hour, and you and I can either partake with God in what he is doing and is about to do on the earth, or we can become an obstacle in bringing to fulfillment that which he has intended, he has purposed, he has ordained. And this is why the Lord's Prayer is very easy for us to say, Our Father in heaven, holy be thy name, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But have we do we see ourselves as a strategic role player in the kingdom work? So the end time is a very definite and appointed season, which God has revealed in his, Bible, in his scripture. What is it that God wants to do in our generation?
Are we seeing what God wants us to see? Are we busy with those things that God values highly? Or are we out of sync with what the Holy Spirit is busy doing? Now, one of the greatest characteristics of God's people in the last days, as one pastor put it, will be their ability to properly discern the ways of God. And so we need to follow the example of the biblical prophets. We need to be aware of the times we are living in today. Like the prophets, we need to be conscious of the following. We need to be conscious of history looking at the past to recollect, remind ourselves of what God has done in order to stir in us to be a strategic partner, role player in God's ordained purpose. Recall what God has done his mercy and grace, his faithfulness, and his ability. Second, we need to be conscious of the present. Times we are living in now, just like the sons of Issachar. Now, 1 Corinthians, Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Now men, the sons of Issachar, they are men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Who was Issachar? He was the ninth son of Jacob. Now, here, what the scripture says, the sons or the descendants, the tribes of Issachar were a group of wise men who were able to look and understand beyond the circumstances. They understood the times and know what Israel should do. They sided, all right, some background. They sided with King David, okay, who was about to take over King Saul. They sided with David, knowing that God has entrusted his trust, all right. God's mentor of governance rests upon David now and no longer on Saul. David's character and passions demanded himself to be surrounded but with men that would help him in the most effective way possible. And how David got that? Obviously, David seek the Lord for counsel and this wisdom came from the wisdom of God. And here, the sons of Issachar or the tribes lived in between season of leadership in Israel during a time of transition. But they were men who understood the time and knew what Israel should do. The world we are living in today is in the major transitions at this moment with all the developments and we need to know where to establish our allegiance. Ishak, his name means there is recompense. Means he will bring a reward. The mom, his mom named him, and it, you can look at the look at Ge, uh, Genesis chapter thirty, verse eighteen. God's reward is always present with those who discern his way. 
indeed. I'm not sure how any of us here name Ishaka. No, right? God's reward is always present with those who discern his ways. He will bring a reward. Third, we need to be conscious of the time to come. The prophets in the Bible saw how God was going to deal with the various issues. In a similar way, today, we need to be focused on his way. We need to live a disciplined lifestyle before the Lord, knowing that the future is in his hand. Let us be conscious of history, conscious of the time now, and conscious of the time to come. We need to discern the time we are living in. God's presence is freely available to us, to everyone. But he does not necessarily share his manifest presence with everyone. What do we mean by that? You and I have to hunger and thirst for it. The gospel is for free, but it will cost you everything you have to get. It will cost you your life. The Lord is about to do unprecedented things in unprecedented ways. And if we do not truly know him, we might become offended by what he's about to do. We need discernment and understanding to rightly judge the coming world. to dwell in him and enjoy his presence. In fact, this is what, at the end of this book, chapter 3, verse 21, what he says here, shall I, Judah, will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations. Verse 21, shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. The whole scripture revealed to us a God that who want to live among us, who want to be so near to us, so close to us, and let us enjoy it in him. The whole creation is waiting with earnest expectations for the period when the children of God shall be made known in the glory prepared for them. In Romans, as what Paul said. So let us not grow weary in giving ourselves towards continued spiritual growth and discernment. It is God's will that we properly discern the importance of the, the time we are living in. Let us not be a fool. And so this response song, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessings fall on me.
Once again, let us spend a moment to reflect on what you heard this afternoon. May God help us open our eyes so that we see what God sees. What is it that God wants us to do in this time, in our generation? Are we seeing what God wants us to see? Are we busy with those things that God values? Or are we out of sync with what the Holy Spirit is busy doing? Let's spend a moment. Close your eyes, come before the Lord. May God speak to you, speak to me. Where we stand today before the Lord. Amen.